Emily Wilding Davidson was a BA of Oxford University. She had taken first class honours in English. Yet the women's cause made such an appeal to her, her reason and her sympathies, that she put aside every intellectual and social appeal and devoted herself to the work of the Union. She had suffered many imprisonments and had been forcibly fed and most brutally treated. On one occasion, when she had barricaded her cell against the prison doctors, a hose pipe was turned on her from the window. She was, she was drenched and all but drowned in icy water. Miss Davison, after this experience, expressed the deep conviction that, that now the conscience of the people would awaken only to sacrifice of a human life. She stood alone there, close to the white painted rails where the course bends round at Tattenham Corner. She looked absorbed and yet far away from everybody else and seemed to have no interest in what was going on around her. A minute before the race started, she raised a paper of her own or some kind of card before her eyes. I was watching her hand. It did not shake. Even when I heard the sound of the horse's hooves pounding close, I saw she was still smiling. And suddenly she slipped under the rail and ran out into the middle of the race course. It was all over so quickly. Emily was under the hooves of one of the horses and seemed to be hurled for some distance across the grass. The horse stumbled sideways and the jockey was thrown from its back. She lay very still. Mrs. Pankhurst was out of prison on medical grounds as the funeral of Emily Davison approached. Without consultation, she extended her license in order to be able to attend. She was, of course, arrested, and for the first time went on both hunger and thirst strike. Mary Richardson was provoked to take action. Law and its application reflected public opinion. Values were stressed from the financial point of view, not the human. I felt I must make my protest from the financial point of view, therefore, as well as letting it be seen as a symbolic act. I had to draw the parallel between the public's indifference to Mrs. Pankhurst's slow destruction and the destruction of some financially valuable object. A painting came to mind. Yes. The Venus Veloque had painted hanging in the National Gallery. It was highly prized for its worth in cash. If I could damage it, I reasoned I could draw my parallel. I went out and spent my last shilling on an axe. I mentioned that these were my last shillings to show that I, like other militants, lived on our own small incomes and were not able to draw on large sums of money for my headquarters. I dashed up to the painting. My first blow with the axe merely broke the protective glass. The sound of the glass breaking attracted the attention of the attendant at the door, who in his frantic efforts to reach me slipped on the highly polished floor and fell face downwards. 
And so I was given time to get in four further blows with my axe before I was in turn attacked. Two Baedeker guidebooks, truly aimed by a German tourist, came cracking against the back of my neck. A detective sprung on me and grabbed the axe from my hand. Angry people seemed to appear all around me. I was dragged this way and that. Once again, I was taken back to Holloway. This time I knew there would be a long term of forcible feeding to face. I was in comparatively good health. I had but two wishes, two hopes. One, that Mrs. Pankhurst might benefit from my protest. And the other, that my heart would give out quickly. It is strange to think that it is our hearts that brought us into this movement and that only its weakness could give us back our freedom.